first. If you've been, if you've been watching the last few weeks, you can see that I've asked this question a lot. Last few weeks has been about the case. Right? It's been about these drugs, and the profit, and the, the new drugs and stuff that are taking this from our upper upper zone of vision, right? The upper zone of vision, upper zone of awareness, the uh, science about depression, the depression about the upper zone of vision. It's that magic wand that kind of changes the world. But if it's growing in us, it's fresh and exciting in us, it's not good for us. Right? Uh, I was watching a, a television show, and uh, uh, how many people here like fruitcake? Okay, got a few really like that. That's amazing. Um, the show was really about re-gifting, right? And, and why that comes up, fruitcake, because that's one of the things that gets re-gifted a lot, right? If people don't like it, they, they just say, mm, no. That's what I got for my present. Oh, that's good. It's fruitcake. That's good. Uh, I think you like fruitcake, but I can re-gift that to you. And they didn't re-wrap it, stick a, a bow on it, and just send it on its way. You know, and sometimes you feel guilty about re-gifting. Anybody here ever feel guilty about re-gifting? I guess you're hoping it's only that you don't accidentally get That's right. But you're just sort of hoping that maybe the person that you gift it to isn't like two years down the road isn't the person you gave it to, and you sort of think, hey, maybe I did something good. Um, why are we talking about regifting today? Is because regifting is the foundation of Christianity. Um, our, our scripture that's up here in Matthew chapter 10, we start in there and it says, um, I'm going to start with verse 5, and it says, And the twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not unto the way of the Gentiles, and to the, any of the cities of the Samaritans. Enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. And so the reality is, we're not called to go and give something that we made up or we invented or we created or something. We're just called to re-give back what God has given us. That's called re-giving. <laughs> right? You know, so we make it a lot more complicated than it is because we think there's this thing that we have to make it into to package it separately or something. And all God is saying to us is we have to um, give back what God has given to us. Now, it's really important we understand the concept because you can't really do the things of God until you understand purely, truly what re-gifting is. Okay? In, in John chapter 15, I'm going to be starting at verse 9, but in John chapter 15, Jesus is speaking and he says, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Now think about that. Um, Jesus loves us as the Father loves him. Now, there's a couple of great things in that. Verse 9. There's a couple of good things in that. The first one is that we are loved by Jesus in the same way and to the same extent that God has loved Jesus. Now, think about that. How significant that is. Right? That's phenomenal. Because, I mean, that is just a phenomenal concept to think about. So, so God loves Jesus and in the same way, in the same measure, in the same capacity, Jesus loves us. Now, why do we need to understand that? Let's move on. It says, continue you in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that your joy might remain in me, and that your joy might be full. Okay, so when you wake up in the morning and everything's gone awful or you, you get home from wherever and everything is a disaster, right? Jesus wants us to be able to come back to this point and understand that in spite of what's going on, that the love of Jesus is supposed to remain in you, right? All week long you've been hearing stuff that someone at work or some neighbor says about you or that the enemy says about you and, and there's a temptation to believe that. So we need to come back to what does God say? God says that as the Father loves me, so Jesus loves us, and that love should remain in us. For what purpose? For what purpose? Well, just that our joy might be full, right? Okay? So we at least have that. You know, everything else can be going crazy, but at least we have the fact that in through it all, Says, 
with my commandments that you love one another. Why don't you go find it easy to love other people? And then you just take them with us. That's pretty good what they've done. But he gives us the clue in the rest of the sentence. He says that you love one another as I have loved you. Now I want you to understand that when Jesus calls us to love other people, he's asking us not to do something from our human experience. He's asking us to re-gift something. approach that. It's not about me trying to muster something up inside and have feelings for someone. That's not what we're talking about. Right? But that's the way we can learn to love more, right? Mm. Love is good. Love is good. When God wants us to understand is that the love of God he's talking about is something he's going to give you. Now that's why So when we come here and we're feeling dry and everything, we have to remember the next part of that whole thing is that we have to find the point that we have to give when we don't have anything to give. When you come before God, some of the most intimate times you'll ever have with God is the times you feel least like worshiping God in the whole world. You will turn around to the most amazing time in God's presence because out of your emptiness, out of your lack, you come before him.
sort of do that little skip down the street, and, and now, you know, before it was like, oh, I gotta work, and I was like, oh, I can't just like, you know, I gotta put this into the movie, because I've never seen it before, I gotta act like I'm this person, because it's never, right? And everything begins to change. So today we want to talk about that, about what is it that can motivate us in our allegiance to Him? James chapter 1, verse 15. Yeah, James chapter 1, starting with uh, verse 15. And it says, down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning, of his own will he fashioned us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You see, God had uh, made a plan, and the plan is that we would be like him. And if you look around the room, you're going to go, uh, I don't get that. <laughs> no, right? No, you don't. But it's not about external, when we're talking about the external, we're talking about the life of God in us, right? Now, if you remember the story of the woman at the well, Jesus gets there, and it says that Jesus was tired, and he was hungry, and they sat down at the well there, and the disciples said, oh, well, you're hungry, well, we'll go get something to eat, and they go away and get something to eat. Jesus is left there with this woman who comes out to draw water. to her, he says, the water that I would give you to drink will be drank that you would never thirst again. Now that sounds exciting, right? In John chapter 7, verse 37. stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And there's that offer of water there. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. And many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said of a truth, this man is a prophet. And others said, this is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? So they were divided in their opinion. And so, if we're going to give something, we have to have something. You know, we talk about giving when we have nothing. When we have little. But it's pretty hard to give something if you don't have anything.
something, it has to be this thing that becomes self-sustaining. Right? And I don't know what Jesus never had a lot. Now, he tried to teach the disciples to listen to the voice of God, but because the Holy Spirit had to come, they didn't have enough time with him. They had a really difficult time with him. You can remember that the people were all gathered around and Jesus was preaching, and I don't know, maybe Jesus preached a long time, I don't know, but it says at the end of it, after Jesus had been preaching, that he said that um, the disciples came to him and said, Jesus, you've got to send the people away because they've been here a long time and, and, and they've got a long way to go to get home and, and they haven't had anything to eat. And, and the disciples' response was, well, so let's just send them home. And Jesus' response was, well, you just feed them. Just feed them. And they looked out there and they said, their understanding of how they were going to feed them was we need a lot of money to go and buy enough food to feed these people. And Jesus said, well, what have you got? And they said, well, you know, we have a few fish and a loaf of bread, sir, but that's not going to get you anything. Hmm. A meal. And Jesus said, well, call these fish and let them fish as fresh as they are. I, I, I can't imagine You know, if you were in that crowd that day, you didn't want to be in the front row. You know why? The people in the front row only got a little bit because the disciples thought that it was only a little bit to give. At the back, they were just tossing it around because it was a, there was they couldn't give it away, right? You wanted to be at the back of the crowd because by that point they realized there's enough food to feed these people and more. In the front row, you know, you probably got the scoopies, you know, but and and they go and they take this bread and the fish and they're giving it out and they're giving it out. says that when they were done, after they fed everybody, that they picked up 12 baskets full of little bit. You see, if we're going to be able to give like that, we got to get beyond this. Okay? Because as long as you're still thinking, where's the money going to come from? We're not going to be able to do what God wants us to do. So we need to understand that God's provision comes from a different place, a different belief, a different thought, and a whole different process than that we think. There is, and I want to say this to you, there is no lack in God's kingdom. Right? There is no lack in God's kingdom. The problem isn't with God. you're a strong-willed person, I'm just going to will my way to it, because you know what? You're going to burn out in your ability to get done again. You are. And you're going to come to the end of your ability in, in your human strength to do it, and you're going to be burnt out. It comes from us recognizing our weakness. Remember in Paul writes and he says, when I am weak, then I am strong. When we recognize our weakness and our need for God, and so, so when we talk about that, we, we tie all these pieces together. We talked about re-gifting. In order for us to be able to re-gift something, Jesus 
says, love one another as I have loved you. That's how you're supposed to love. Not, not the way your mom loves you, not the way your uncle loves you, not the way your neighbor loves you. You're supposed to love one another the way he loves you. You can't do that as humans. We need something supernaturally from somewhere else. It's God himself. Thank you. 